answer this one question. I feel as though our hiring practices are leading us blank. And you fill in the blank. So talk about your firm, your organization, your company. When it comes to growing your organization, your hiring practices are leaving you blank. Go ahead and pause the recording right now and answer the question. When you're finished, resume the recording. So it's leaving us uh, guessing, questioning, hoping, and praying. Yes, Rebecca with All American. Go ahead and chat your answer in. Short handed, your hiring practices are leaving you short handed. But um, I was actually going to say the same thing short staffed. Stephanie, Gracie Pack Martial Arts and uh, Jits University. Um, with a lengthy, time consuming hiring process and with a minimal pool of qualified applicants to consider. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else want to share? I'll throw. Go ahead. I'll go. Um, I would say lack of millennial talent, and which is causing stagnant growth. Bill? Yeah, so this is for one of my clients who I met with yesterday. We were talking about this, and he's a roofing company. So he said with more of the same, um, with untrustworthy people, and skeptical. Can I ask a question here? Yep. What do you mean by millennial? Meaning we lack millennial talent in our company. Okay. As in you want millennials? Yes. Or? Okay. <laughs> I had, an, I had an interesting conversation with a, with a business owner down in uh, Sarasota yesterday and uh, her struggles with uh, dealing with all the, the millennial talent out there, actually. So they're at the opposite. Uh, That's what Mark. My wife actually had to go to training in Atlanta. She's a Harvard community manager. She has a lot of millennial staff yeah. on how to manage these people, work with these, these people. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's probably another another seminar. <laughs> well, I, I'm going I'm to touch on a little bit. So do you agree with Jen when she says lack of millennial talent? Yeah. There, what, lack of millennial talent. It, it depends. on. In Miami, we have uh, probably the most millennials, and they drag our average that seven and a half down because they've probably been there two and a half or three years. But I do believe I'm not down on millennials because just like in my generation, your generation, for what we're looking for, there are that that one percent that really want to be entrepreneurial and really want to, you know, go out there and one percent make it happen. Yeah, it's a small group I think that we're looking for that you know that really want to go out there, love it, and 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 do it. You know, the other, you know, then we we were, we'll recruit them and, and get them on board here, and then the other ones are probably in prison or something. But the <laughs> but the ones that we find that come on okay. board and they do really really well. Okay. Um, anybody else want to comment or make any comments here? Let me show you a quick video. In today's environment, selecting and retaining top talent should be your organization's number one priority because 80% of turnover is caused by bad hiring decisions. Did you know? 60% of your workforce is considering leaving their current job once the economy improves. The average employee turnover is 23% annually. The turnover costs U.S. employers $11 billion a year. We can do better. It takes an average of eight weeks to recruit and hire a new employee. Employee retention has as much to do with who you hire as what you do after they are hired. Did you know behavioral interviewing yields 52% better results in the hiring process? Most organizations who used advanced assessments in the selection process experienced a 92% or more retention rate. Keep in mind, job benchmarking is the most important and most neglected step in beginning a selection and development process. That's why Fortune 100 companies use job benchmarking to acquire their talent. Red Rock Leadership. We help companies and individuals grow stronger by bringing highly effective resources and certified techniques to your high performance team. Visit redrockleadership.com today to see how you can experience the growth you deserve. We came across this process called custom job benchmarking about eight years ago. And um, I've not traditionally been an assessment guy. 
So uh, now we're we're sold out on assessments here. So we're um, value added associates for a company out of Scottsdale, Arizona called TTI Success Insights. And the way that we the way that that whole system uh, operates is that uh, they they want to bring you in and they want you to actually market their assessments like any other assessment company does. They do something a little bit unique and. Um, they brought us out there about eight years ago, introduced this, this idea of custom job benchmark to us. I'm going to go into some detail about it in a little while, and um, I'll warn you up front. This will be a little bit of a sales pitch for custom job benchmarking. I will also let you know that there are some ways that you could do ad hoc benchmarking on your own. We just happen to use a formal process introduced to us by TTI Success Insights. So that's, that's going to be where we're going to head, and I'm going to show you how to locate and find and... Um, and and identify top talent. Let me give you um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, a kind of story background here. So we have a service here called Active Sales Management, and um, Jen's familiar with it, um, and, some, and Scott's familiar with it. Obviously, Philip. But Active Sales Management is a service that uh, what we do is we could fill the role of a sales manager in a company for a company that's too large not to have a sales manager but too small to perhaps maybe afford one or keep a full-time sales manager busy. So we literally, um, I'm working with a company in Chicago right now, a $65 million company who basically has disassembled their sales team and is reassembled and they've called us in to kind of help them reconstruct comp plan, structure, um, targeting, things like that. So we've got pretty good experience in this, in this segment. There's one company locally here that we've been working with for four years, and when I started working with them, they had no sales team whatsoever. And uh, when when Aaron brought me in, the name of the company is Direct Components. He gives a little testimony on the website. He doesn't mind me using his name, but he has 15 salespeople now. He had he had literally, I think, two salespeople when we first started. I say none, but it was it was about two salespeople when we started. Um, when he brought me in, and he, I took him to some initial training. He wanted to build this sales team. The first thing I said is, you have to create a custom job benchmark. He did it. Now he literally gives me carte blanche over the whole entire process. So I have, um, I don't, I would imagine within the next year or two, we're going to actually backfill what I'm doing with a full-time sales manager. But here's the story behind it. I'm a living testimonial for the custom job benchmark. So there's a process that I use, and I go through the process with you all that um, that allows us to shorten our cycle when it comes to interviewing and identify top talent right out of the gate so that we can run them through a simulation, assess them against our custom job benchmark, and then when that happens, uh, we, we can assess them against that custom job benchmark and we'll find out if they're actually somebody's going to perform in the position. So that's kind of where we're going to go in this session today. Let me introduce a couple things to you, and I'll make this slide presentation available to you afterwards. Um, so let's talk about some of today's top workplace challenges. Uh, Stephanie, you're probably sick and tired of saying this. Um, our, 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 the top challenges of today, um, and this is coming from a lot of research that I've done to actually write the book that I'm writing right now. So we've got the book uh, formatted. It's about 50% complete. Much of this has come out of the research I've done for the book. But today's top workplace challenges, interpersonal conflict, lack of courage, succession planning issues, inability to manage time, lack of assistance, lack of systems and processes, poor hiring skills, low trust, low motivation, too much criticism and not enough coaching. And so, to some extent, the market, the culture that we live in today is speaking this out to us. These are not the same top challenges that existed 10 years ago when I started this company. It's crazy. I mean, to look at things like uh, interpersonal conflict, we never really really explain what interpersonal conflict was. We just, we saw people who argued, right? We disciplined them to snap them back into place and we dealt with it. I mean, low motivation was something, again, that we, we were finding people who were self-motivated. Um, even hiring, hiring has become increasingly more difficult. I know the market's tight, but one of the main issues is that cut the companies are doing more training today than they've ever done before, and they're retaining their they're retaining their top talent longer than they ever have before. So we have to, we have to find out where those trigger moments are and how to attract them to us. Um, and there's only one way to do that. I'm gonna, I'll explain that in a little while. So here's the other thing we have to understand, and this will speak a little bit to what Tom said. Uh, when it comes to leadership within your organization, 
we've transitioned away from the reign of heroic leaders. So my generation, the Gen X generation, we were the heroes, right? We were the ones that were going to conquer the world. We didn't trust anybody. We're highly competitive. We're driven. Um, we gave birth to a, to, a, to a generation that is not really responding to the way that we were raised when we came out of the gate. And um, then the generation prior to them who gave birth to them is, is completely different. Let me show you some examples. So we're, we're, we're actually in the, in the era of the rise of the collaborative leader. So heroic leaders and collaborative leaders. Let, let me just show you the difference between the two. Um, heroic leaders make others earn their trust, while collaborative leaders trust others from day one. Quick question for you out of the gate. Stephanie heard this yesterday. Um, is trust an action or a feeling? Yeah. Trust is an action. And I'm not going to go any further. We can argue about it after the session. <laughs> trust is an action. Is love an action or a feeling? Yeah. Love's, love's an action. So just uh, go to marriage counseling. Obviously, you all have great marriages. You've never been to marriage counseling before. Um, you'll learn when you go to marriage counseling that, that love is an action. Okay? It, it, takes, it takes intentionality to love. It takes intentionality to trust. Trust, what causes somebody not to trust is a feeling. What causes somebody to trust is actually a feeling. So a little bit of a trick question, but so this is the first time in many, many generations, if ever, that we've ever had to address this, this really this concept of trust. And here's what we know about the generation that's upon us. They crave truth. They crave the truth. So here's the other thing. Heroic leaders believe in constructive criticism, while collaborative leaders believe in coaching. Heroic leaders hire and fire based on gut instinct, while collaborative leaders hire and fire based on core values. Heroic leaders take credit for positive results, while collaborative leaders credit others for positive results. Heroic leaders blame, uh, place, uh, blame for poor results, while collaborative leaders credit others for positive results. Heroic leaders create a legacy by controlling uh, to by taking control to control or, or protect their, their reputation, while collaborative leaders, they create their legacy by serving and taking care of others. So some would say, yeah, 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 I got it. So millennials are soft. Um, actually, that's not entirely true. Let's take a look at the five generations in the workplace today. That's right, five generations, okay? Never before in the history of the United States have we thought, found that Five generations are actually all at work at the same time in the workplace. And what's interesting is um, I want you to take a look at who's dominating the workplace right now. So you have traditionalists, boomers, Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen 2020. Okay, so as we look at the graph, we'll start at the bottom. In 2005, the baby boomers were the dominant, were the dominant population in our culture. The Gen X generation just never produced enough individuals to, to really make a noticeable difference when it came to the number of baby boomers. Well, then what ends up happening is, you're going to look what happens with millennials. From 2005 to 2010 to 2015 to 2020, now they say by 2020, we're going to have more millennials in the workplace than both boomers and Gen Xers put together. More than 50% of our workforce by 2020 is going to be millennial. When you put Gen 2020 in there, it's much more than that. Gen 2020 is the generation behind it. And all of this means something. So let, let's take a look here. Let's take a look at the way that the traditionalists, these are the 80-year-olds that are still at work in the, in, the, in the workplace. They're still out there. Some of you may call on them. They were influenced by the Great Depression. They're um, also WW2. Their traits is that they're loyal, they respect authority, they're stubborn and dependable. Their views is that they hide and pay cash, education was a privilege, and management tells me what to do. I literally am, have clients, and, and, and you do too, but it's more noticeable for me because I'm a training company, okay, that have fathers, traditionalists, still running their company, and when they bring me in, OK, it's it's like, what have you done? Why would you betray all the family secrets to somebody who could train us? They are to them. Education is something that's a privilege. 
that only the people, the elite people would ever pay for, right? So back then, training was something that really wasn't predominant, wasn't really expected. It was the school of hard knocks. And so they grew up thinking that management's whole purpose was to tell people what to do. Then you look at the boomers, influenced by the Vietnam War, the 1960s, the civil rights movement. Moms would stay at home and dads would go to work. Traits is that they're well-educated, they question authority, they have good teamwork skills, and their views on money is that they buy now, pay later. Education is a birthright, and management, well, really, they know better than management. So baby boomers are the type of people that sort of rejected this idea that they were being told what to do, that they were going to take matters into their own hands, right? Education is something that is a necessary evil that we never really had an opportunity to have. And this is the generation who really started to believe that, hey, listen, training may not be a bad idea. Then we bring the Gen X into the, into the question, influenced by divorced parents, delinquent homes, Reagan, the end of the Cold War. Their traits, independent, family-focused, intolerant of bureaucracy, hardworking and critical of others. So anything that looks like a bureaucracy to a Gen Xer is, is, is a no-no. Do not turn my place into a corporation. They're, they're not really big business uh, corporation thinkers by, by nature. They're very critical of others. They're very fearful of others, taking advantage of them. They're hardworking. They've learned through criticism growing up in the school of hard knocks. And their views on money is they're cautious conservative. Education is a tool to get ahead, right? And management seeks a hero. So all of a sudden, this generation pulls back on training a little bit and says, hey, listen, it's probably not needed. You can learn the way I learned, right? Heck, I was running paper routes when I was in when I was eight years old, right? I was uh, I was um, you know out there uh, you know working in my dad's gas station, pumping gas when I was ten or twelve years old. Well, this generation gives birth to a generation that they don't want that generation to suffer the same things that they, they suffered. So they are influenced by the Gen X gives birth to the millennials, which is um, the millennials are influenced by doting parents, 9-11, Columbine, video gaming. Their traits is that they're fast paced. Check this out. They think like entrepreneurs. It's actually not just the 1% that think like entrepreneurs. It's actually the rule, not the exception, that they think like entrepreneurs. I mean, I, I don't know if you, anybody knows any. I, I've got one client whose who's, uh, son sells vintage Air Jordans online, makes $2,000 a month at the age of 16, <laughs> right? I, I mean, this is, this is the world they live in, right? So they're, they're, they're eBay savvy. They, they make, I, I brought a kid in from uh, Paraguay, lived with us for a year. Um, he, was, he was on a visitor visa, that couldn't work. So we had him clean out our garage, and he just went on eBay. He made a living on eBay. That's how he made, it. That's how he made his living while he was here. So they value relationships. They're highly mobile. They're obsessed with information. Their views is on money is that they earn to spend. Education is a necessary investment. Check that out. If, if you're hiring a millennial into your organization and you don't have a training program in place, it's, it, it's, it's not going to work for them. This is to them being told what to do from a young age or being taught what to do from a young age is something that's necessary. Management is an obstacle to moving up. They don't need people to tell them what to do. They don't want to be, they want to be left alone, left alone. So why benchmark? Why benchmark? Um, so there's no right or wrong when it comes to individual behaviors, motivators, and skills, but experience tells us that certain behaviors and motivators and skills are a better fit for certain jobs than others. Um, let me just stop right here, take a quick checkup from the neck up, take a deep breath, and sort of just kick this out to you based on what you just saw on the previous screens. Um, and I know it went pretty quick. But what are your thoughts about five generations in the workplace? What are your thoughts about what's out there in the pool of people to be hired and, and how we're going about hiring them? Just, you know, based on some of the things that are up here, some of the things I just introduced. And um, Rebecca, feel free to chat. We have you up on the screen. Philip's going to keep an eye on that. 
Nicole, if you've joined us, you could feel to speak as well. But what are, let's take a little bit deeper into our struggles with hiring. And let me just hear your thoughts. Let me be quiet for a few minutes. Who wants to start? Yeah. So this is personally impacted me currently. Um, senior leadership that said, you know, my approach is the same to everyone. And with the different generations, you need to approach the people differently. Though I personally feel I approach them differently, they don't see it that way. And that's one reason why I started looking for leadership training. Say, you know, how do I communicate better with these different generations? So like you said, some absorb the feedback better than others. Others just want to be left alone. Yeah. Um, okay. So if you don't mind, describe, can you describe the stru structure of your organization? Go for it. Yeah. So we got, uh, we're a financial uh, investment platform. So we have our back office operation teams. We have our client service teams. Some are hourly employees um, and some are salary more experience, you know, 10, 20 years in the business, and then we have people right out of college. Okay. Um, so. All right. And um, how many how many people in the organization total? Is it a big organization? Uh, we've got about 2,500. Okay. So it's a big organization. Yeah. Where's the headquarters? Uh, California. Okay. And you are, um, you're a regional um, manager? So we had three organizations that merged. Okay. Yeah. And how, where do you, what, what part of the organization do you run and what, who do you oversee? Uh, all the client services division for our private label funds. Got it. Yeah. And how many direct reports do you mind me asking? Uh, yeah, about 17. Okay. Fair enough. Um, does the company have core values? Stated yes. core values? Yes. Uh, put you on the spot. What are they? Yeah. We actually, because we just merged, yeah. we just implemented them. Okay. I couldn't tell you. All right. You know, we, we just launched this new program okay. in 2017, so I've been busy. Gotcha. All right. Fair enough. They, good response, by the way. I knew I was putting you on the spot. You right, know, no problem. Well. Um, you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, guys. I am, uh, I'm Lisa. Um, I own Perfect Touch Massage in West Chase. Um, I'm a small business, and I'm just starting out, and I'm looking to branch out and hire other people, but I'm coming into, running into the problem where people just don't, they don't want to work, they don't want to build, they want you to hand customers to them, and... Um, so I'm just looking to get more information on how to find the right people. How do you fix it? Yep. Right. Good. Yeah. Okay. Who else wants to comment? Well, I'd agree with, um, with the first comment. He said the one size fits all management style is doesn't work. It doesn't work. Or you got to hire. You just hire to that to your leader. And one of the things we got to be careful about is a lot of leaders will just hire in their own image, and unfortunately. Um, you know, that might work for a while, but eventually um, it's, you know, it's an impediment to growth and not an uh, impediment to growth. Then, what if they're not the right person in the first place? Who's they're not the right person in the first place. So, but how do we know that some of our comments aren't biased already? Like some of our comments that we're saying right now aren't biased already. You know what I mean? So, for example, Lisa's comments, in which, by the way, I've said those exact okay. same words, right? Uh, I can't find people that, that will work or can't find people. There's nobody out there that's hungry or, you know, the one size management, you know, doesn't, it's one, one size fits all doesn't work anymore. How do we know where our self limiting thoughts are letting, letting go? And we're, are we, I mean, I, are we just missing it? I mean, is there a better, you, you follow what I'm saying? I think you know, you, we, our experiences bring our biases to it. We know what's worked in the past, and you mentioned the generations. Yeah, I can see everybody, I'm sure, saw themselves in one of those grids there, and you see that. And you try to be aware of your strengths and your weaknesses and your failures. You know, I got a whole book of things I'll never do again. Um, right. So, how many people in the room like love to play uh, pickleball? Anybody love to play pickleball? You guys ever played pickleball? <laughs> you know the rules of pickleball? No. I don't even know what pickleball is. No. Yeah. Okay, so so we got we got, we got, we got let me see real quick. We got one, okay. two, three, okay. four, five, six, seven, eight of us. We got Rebecca right. online, the the online, one? that's ten. <laughs> Frank Tracy and that's eleven. Um and if Gary Sport joins us into point joining us, that'll be that'll be twelve, which I don't think he's going to. So let's just say we've got twelve people here, and I'm gonna bring six people in to this room to mesh with us twelve. Okay, uh, and that'll that'll put uh, that'll put us just you know I, I took fifty percent of us and I brought just fifty percent of us and I brought us brought them in and put them in the room and all they're going to talk about is pickleball. They're going to sit amongst us and they're going to start talking about the rules of pickleball 
and you know how fun pickleball is and the, the competitive aspect of it and where the leagues are and all that stuff. Just a quick question. This is a layup question. I'm going to give it to Jen. Okay, Jen, this is an easy one. Easiest question you're going to get all day. Ready? At the end of 20 minutes, if all 12 people are here and we've got six new people in the room also talking to us about pickleball, just off the top of your head, just what do you think most of us will be talking about? If they're intermingled with us, pickleball. You really think so? Final yeah. answer. Final answer. Would it? Would we all agree with her? Yeah. Okay. So the reality was, prior to that discussion, nobody knew anything about pickleball, right? In fact, I said pickleball, and one person <laughs> said, "I don't even know what pickleball is." Almost to the extent to, to even maybe even say, you know, I really didn't come here to talk about pickleball, and <laughs> like it sounds weird to me anyway. So I'd rather just not even. And some of you already started forming some opinions in your mind about what is pickleball. It sounds like an old person sport. It sounds like something from another land. Then a couple of you are like, actually, I wouldn't mind learning something new. Notice how like the introduction of something new will send some of us pushing away, some of us leaning in, and some of us just feeling indifferent. My point is this. We are, every year, we increase the number of people in our population with people that aren't anything like us to the point now where literally when you're in a room of a hundred people, you can expect that about 50 of those people are going to be millennials. If you're at a work networking event, 50 of the hundred people are going to be millennials. If the 50 of the hundred people are millennials, what do you think the other people are going to start thinking like over some extended period of time? Millennials. Millennials. Here's the here's here's this here's the secret in all of this. Our culture has been influenced, our culture has been impacted, and we don't think the same way as a culture that we did five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. And for us to take our thinking from the past and try to apply it to today, you can't take yesterday's problems or today's problem and fix them with yesterday's solutions. Okay. It, it's just, it's going to render you inconclusive. So hear me when I say, I've got a team of 15 people. I've got one woman who is 62 years old and she used to be a matchmaker. Last year she made $225,000 as an inside salesperson. I've got another person who job hopped. Okay for five or six jobs, he's in his mid forties. Okay. He's been divorced. He's got a kid with a new wife. He's got to start, start his life over, has a lot of drama in his past, has no evidence of succeeding in his past in a sales job. Lots of drama. He made 85 ish thousand dollars last year as an inside salesperson in his second year at this company. Um, and, and you're probably like, well, what are they selling? What does it matter? The, the point is we're taking people from all different makes and models, all different generations, and we're bringing them in and we're putting them on a three month track. And after three months, check, check this out over the course of the last three and a half years, anybody who's made it three months has never left the company, has never left the company. We've got millennials working with boomers, working with Xers, no traditionalists and a gen 2020. Okay. The point that I'm trying to make is this, the way that we made it happen was we benchmarked the position. We benchmarked the position. Um, let me draw something up here for you and, and Claire, this will be something that you can take back. You can tell me you learned something today. It didn't even cost you anything yet. Um, so a vision is supported by goals. Goals are supported by a strategy. Strategy are supported by action steps. And action steps are supported by accountability. Now, this structure, which I call the foundation for success, as with any foundation, if you were to build this with 
concrete blocks and throw some mortar in there, if there was to be a, some settlement or some shifting, you would see parts of this begin to crumble. Um, what holds all of this together is rebar that are called your core values. Um, Ten years ago, core values were something that we developed so we could put on our website. In fact, you would hire a marketing firm to develop these core values so that you could put them on the side of the wrap on your truck or put them on a billboard or put them, you know, put them on your website and, and send them out on mailers and things like that because you wanted people to know that, hey, we're West Chase, whatever it is, we're a massage, and, you know, we are, we are safe and we are competent and we are licensed and, you know, whatever it might be, you know, we are, you know, you wanted people to know kind of who you were, so we would we would use this buzzword as core values to show people, hey, listen, we're not afraid to show you who we really are. And we all know that was that was just that was marketing. That was a marketing ploy. It, because if you asked anybody in the organization, they'd actually actually go to the website page and actually read the core values. So here's the thing. Don't miss me on this. Don't miss on this one, because I'm gonna tie it into the benchmark. Your core values are what hold the structure together, and, and it's not just millennials. It's the whole entire population of workers today are going to be, 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 they're going to follow your lead when it comes to what you believe in. This generation is after truth, that they're after truth, which means that they want to trust you. They have been from a young age. They have been they have been nurtured to say to the teacher, I'm not comfortable with my seat. Please move me to a different chair. Uh, they've been nurtured to go to the teacher and say, my, my, I've told this to my kids. If you got a bad grade, you go to the teacher and tell the teacher you're not satisfied with that grade and you want to do something to get a better grade. We've taught our kids from a young age, and we sort of, we kind of smirk at it. We say, oh, we've coddled these kids. But really what we've done is we've taught them to think on their own from a young age. We've educated them, so when they come to you, they're asking you, Clint, how, show me how to behave. Show me how to act. Give me a safe environment to live in. Give me a safe environment to work in. I'll do whatever needs to be done for the greater, greater good. Clint, what's the greater good? Lisa, what's the greater good? I'll go out and get new customers and bring them in because I'm working for the greater good, but tell me what the greater good is. And if us as business owners, or us as business leaders, all we're doing is focusing on either you know, trying to build our organization or pay our bills, that, that's our own belief system. They're not going to follow that because it's flawed. That does, it's not led with internal motivation. They want to be intrinsically motivated. The way that they're intrinsically motivated is they're tied to your core values. When you get your organization tied to your core values, they're going to be focused on your vision. That enters in the custom job benchmark. This custom job benchmark will help you take the ideals of your organization and put them in a place so when you assess people, you'll be able to get people on board from, your, your, from the outside who are focused and have tendency that align with what your values are. Let me show you. Most are quick to answer this question. Let's take our top performance and try to clone them. I know what it takes. I'll just tell you. Well, there's there's a there's a problem with this thinking. See, man. There's there's a problem with this way of thinking. If we take and we assess for ourselves and we try to clone our top performers, um, those top performers may be legacy people that just have. They've been walking in the same tracks year after year after year. There's a problem with this way of thinking, and the problem is this, is that we set up, somebody said it earlier, we set up our own personal biases. And we limit ourselves. Job benchmarking minimizes the bias and provides a clear objective and uh, an collective voice for what behaviors, motivators, and skills the job actually needs. So what we'll do, this is a patented process. If you choose to use our process, if not, I'll show you how to do it ad hoc. The patented process, and I, I was like, I always just took this for granted. And then I had a really good client of mine one day say to me, um, hey, Jeff, I'm bought into the process. Can I get a copy of the patent? Are you kidding me? This guy's worked with me for years. Clearly a Gen Xer. Um, 
So I downloaded the, the patent. It's 167 pages. And uh, he, this guy, Bill Bonstetter, literally made a patent on this. And so what? let me explain the process. You take up to seven subject matter experts, up to. It could be two, it could be seven. And you put them in a round table. And what happens is you exhaust this question, why does the job exist? And you get the job to actually speak for itself. And the job speaks, and you capture what the job's saying. You capture what it says. I'm going to show you how we capture it. Once that, once all of that's captured, okay, we what we do is we we break them into three to five segments, and we label those segments, and then we take you, the subject matter experts, or whoever the subject matter experts are, and we take you to an online assessment. And we basically it's like fingerprinting you. Like we take you to an online assessment, and you take. And you respond to this instrument as if you are the job. So you feed information into this online survey, that, and then it produces what's called a multi-responder report. That multi-responder report then kicks back uh, something that allows us to see exactly what we need to see to, to determine whether or not somebody's going to actually perform. So in some ways, we're stacking the deck. So it... Yes, Clint, some of the issue you have may be that you could use some leadership skills. There's, I mean, there's no question we could all use some of those things. That might not be the problem, though. You actually may have people in your organization that are going this way, and you need them to go this way. Some of that can be fixed with leadership training. So I could, I could help you understand you know, how to get your core values in order, you know, what it takes to motivate people today, you know, what some of those. But at the end of the day, Seeing how somebody is driven changes everything. So if you look at the illustrations on the screen, the assessment that we're going to use to assess whether or not we have the right person for the job, it, it tells us what drives this person into action, how they're motivated. So for example, if, let's just say Lisa, is going to come to work here at our organization. Um, let's say Lisa is somebody that doesn't really believe in traditional values. Like traditional values actually will cause her to shut down a little bit. For example, um, traditional values meaning um, you know we have meetings the same time every day. We keep certain things in a file cabinet. You know we we have got to like and I'm in, like I'm the leader of the organization, so my core values reflect that of structure, which is um, we are uh, prepared, we are diligent, we are determined. So it's a, it's a very black and white environment. Let's just say that I hire Lisa in this environment, and Lisa's kind of like, you know, I'm not really much of a black and white person. I'm kind of like a, you know, I, I don't necessarily believe that people have to sit in the same place every day sit in the same seat every time. I don't really believe that spreadsheets need to be done the same way every time. Like, I think that variety is the key to life, right? I think that, and so eventually what's going to happen is I continue to drive the organization this way. Because her driving force is not one of structure, she begins to break down in the way that she responds to me. So her why diminishes, her back wheel starts to slow down. It doesn't matter how good she is at her behavior style. She may be everything I need. She may be a people person, a problem solver. She can analyze till the day is done. She can relate to people, everything I need. But if the back wheel's not turning, she's, she's unable to steer the bike with the front wheel. So what ends up happening is she can't keep rolling. Why is it different today than it was 10 years ago? Or is it? Is the culture that much more sensitive today to core values and driving forces than it was five or 10 years ago? Clint, what do you think? Well, I think something that he really touched on was the millennials today, they want to do things in the way that they see it and they've been taught previously they don't like someone telling them what to do so one thing that i had noted is is you know what what's the motivators for these people i've never asked my team what motivates you i help motivate them but it might be that the way i motivate them isn't how they like to be motivated 
So it's like really understanding these people will really help you drive them the way that they want to be driven rather than drive them the way you want to drive them. Sure, sure. Let's hear from the millennials. Mm. Um, I think that we, we believe we want something bigger to believe in. We want something bigger to, you know, sure, it's about making money, but what else do you stand for? Like, what was the end result? What's the end goal? Like, why should I go to that for you kind of thing? Um, so it's a trust thing. It's a what do you stand for other than money? What do you stand for other than just selling something? Like, are you into charities? Do you want to do, do you want to help? You know, whatever it is, maybe I think that that's how our culture has changed, bringing the millennials into the workplace um, and how many of them are actually coming into and we're an important piece of every organization, and yet every organization doesn't want to touch a lot of us. So I think that that is skewed, and I think that it needs to be changed. What do you guys think? Um, I think that the millennials in general, they are more in touch with themselves, not necessarily they're more, they're softer. Um, and then having a clear vision and clear core values established as a business lets them know that they're part of something bigger. So they're going to go to bat and work harder towards that vision when they know what they're working towards. But, and so over the last 10 years, that was the, you know, how it's changed, I guess. And so, um, yeah. I mean, as more, as more the generate in terms of our organization, we don't have that many millennials, so mm -hmm. we really haven't. I mean, I haven't, we've evolved, I guess, in terms of, um, of how we approach things, but marketplace has changed. You need to evolve to you be able to match your competition, the marketplace, things are going on, and then you're hiring to people to do that. We've grown over the last, from my personal experience, over the last 10 years from uh, 150 employees to 550. Um, and so we do have a lot of millennials in the technical mm -hmm. side. Yeah. Um, uh, in administration, we don't. And in Sales, we do, but in the technical side, we got probably 200 of them um, in there. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, Bob, well, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't I'm Let me throw one thing out there. Remember, we're talking about a culture influenced by millennials. Yeah. We're not talking about millennials. Right. And, and I, I want to make it really clear because I think we've come to a point in time where we need to stop labeling people, we need to label a culture. I mean, I've got I've got baby boomers acting like millennials. Yeah. Like I, it's 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 a, it's it's a it's it's what the culture has become because of these five generations. So. So I mean, I guess just from my experience <clears throat> internally, um, at, uh, absolutely, you can't not be influenced by by the different generations as they as they come in. Um, we don't have any millennials around us, so I don't know how much this year. We're still pretty, and our thing's pretty. But if you take just me and Sean alone, That's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, how different our personalities are from everyone else, really, that's older than us. So you, you make a good point, because I had um, a girl, she just left the team about a month ago, but right out of college, never had a job. She came in 10 minutes early, worked hard all day long. Whereas I got a girl the same age that can't make it to work on time to save her life. She doesn't like constructive criticism. So it's not so much that generation, it's culture, like you said. And, you know, I've got adults that, you know, are older than me that have worse work ethic than the younger generation. And so okay. you really made a good point. That's why it's hard to really say, okay, I'm going to treat millennials, talk to millennials this way. And then the Gen X is this way. It's understanding the person. It's it's under it's understanding your culture, and then making sure the people that enter your culture are people that can fit the culture. That's the key, right? Is it make sure that the people that you, that enter your culture are people that can fit your culture. Because it, I mean, we we've gone through a transition. It used to be we would would look at a resume, look for skill set. If you're still looking for a skill set on a resume, I'm going to tell you, that is such old, stinking thinking. And that is the wrong way to do it. I mean, it's just not, I mean, you can look at a resume and, and see that somebody has uh, increased sales 7,000% at their old company and they, they've 
they've managed 250 accounts and they've you know brought five companies public or whatever you want to do. I mean, you can look at all those things and go, oh, that's the person for us. That's a shining resume. That's 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 just not. It doesn't matter. Even if all those, all those things were true, true. If, if true, even if they were true, but even if they were, and most of the time they are to some extent. That's not the point. The point is they were successful in their own right at a different time in a different culture. Today, hopefully where you went with this conversation is people today are much, much, much more sensitive. Much more sensitive. Why is that? It's the culture. It's the shifting of the culture. And I choose to look at it and say this is not a bad thing. This is from a guy who's ex very, very sensitive, I mean, extremely sensitive, who wish I would have, like, I, I mean, you know, learning disabilities when I was a kid, never diagnosed all those kind of things, you know what I mean, that I wish, like, looking back on it, I'm like, man, I don't know, I, I, life seemed to would, I think I'd have got off to a quicker start had I had grown up in a little bit more of a sensitive type environment. I don't think the sensitive environment is a bad environment to have if we can meet the culture where it is. If we can meet the culture where it is. So, any what I'm curious. I didn't mean to come in and steal the conversation. What what happened? I mean, in this in this conversation, did, did you guys come to any thoughts or any? I don't think we really got to any consensus, just our own experiences. But uh, yeah, I can't argue with you said. I mean, that's it makes sense. A lot of it's going on. You don't even realize. You're not really consciously thinking about how we're acting and it depends on each one of your companies where you are in the growth curve in terms of startup mm -hmm. mature you know adolescent stage mm -hmm. you know you're trying to re-engineer it and you know if you run some problems and so different situations require different tools and and, and different people to help you yeah make those changes for you yeah questions i'm going to show you a couple things here on the screen any questions Online, any questions? No. Okay. Um, let me show you this. This is a kind of a hallmark of our training. I just want to kind of throw this in here and to give you an idea of where we're heading. There are three types of people in your organization. There's laggards, loners, and leaders. Laggard is a defensive win-lose person. They're the gossip carriers. They're the ones that complain behind your back, the backstabbers. Um, you know, they they live they live in a win lose paradigm. In other words, somebody else has to lose for them to win. Um, you, you've seen these people. In fact, we probably could have perhaps have been these people at any given time. Sometimes, if you're hungry, angry, ang hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we could slip up and actually become one of these people. These people are low trust people, and they don't persevere. Then you have loners. These are independently minded people. These are legacy people. You leave them alone. You put them in the basement of the red state floor. You forget about them. It's just they, you know, they keep they, their output is consistent. You don't think about it. They don't inspire anybody, and they don't really pull anybody away. Uh, they just sort of run the track. And by the way, there are times when it's not a bad idea to be a loner. You might have to go into a silo to get a job done or a project done. That means you're a win type person. They trust a little and they persevere a little, a little bit more than a laggard. Then there are leaders, and here's the thing. You don't have to be a boss to be a leader anymore. Leaders are every, everywhere in the organization. And so leaders are collaborative, win-win, or walk-away people. So at a time when emotions are running high because of the fear of pace of change and because of the influence of the culture, we have people that are craving our assistance. They're not, they don't want us to do it for them. They just want us to show them the way. And so you can create a culture of people that are leaders. These are people living in what's called the approach state. They're inspirational. They're encouraging. But I will tell you, the laggards are the people whose driving forces do not blend with the, the culture that you're able to produce. And what happens is they slow down, they, they, they pull back, and they start to pull other people down with them. It creates a clash inside the organization. So my goal is to help you. Our goal is to help you build what's called a uh, an environment where you can uh, where you can you can drive forward, not be pulled back. 
this is how we create a custom job benchmark. So believe it or not, this takes four hours to develop. If you're looking to bring somebody in your organization, I don't care if you've got two employees or you've got 2,000 employees. Um, I did this when I hired my assistant. It, it, it'll, depending on the number of people involved, it, will it takes up to four hours to develop this document. And so what you do is you come up with 30 reasons why the job exists, 30. Now, notice that the, if you're taking some notes, these are hard skills. In other words, they're measurable skills. What we don't want to write down are things like, the job exists so that we can have good customer service. That's not why the job exists. The job exists so we could have zero customer service complaints or customer complaints, right? The job exists uh, for the purpose of uh, developing training plans. The job exists for the purpose of seeing 10 prospects a day. The job exists for the purpose of closing $50,000 per month. The job exists for the purpose of taking 16 applications a day. So these are hard skills. When you're all finished, you take these hard skills and then you bucket them into three to five areas. So this is an operations manager's position and we bucket them into, into, into categories. We came up with a category for customer service, financial management, operations management, process creation and training. This is 100% organic. That means this is non-GMO, right? So this is me, we don't take any influence from any other custom job benchmark to build this. We don't take any influence from the current position. We don't look at a job description. This is 100% organic. So these titles, these categories that were put on here, were put on here as a result of what the job spoke about. The job speaks from scratch. So we come up with five categories. Then we let the job, the subject matter experts, let the job give us five, or the, the key accountability statements for each category. Those key accountability statements can then be used to build a job ad. It can be used to build a job description. The, the 30 reasons why the job exists can help you build a comp plan. Then what we do is we rank them and then we weight them. So that way when we're describing the job to somebody over the phone on a phone interview, we can accurately describe what they're going to be doing. And so what I tell people quite frequently is when I bring them in, uh, for a, and I do group interviews, um, by the way, I, I would stop doing one-to-one -one first interviews. Do a phone screen, bring them in for a group interview. It'll save you a ton of time. Bring them in for a group interview, and what I let them know is, hey, listen, the only purpose of me here today is to scare you away from this job. I want to push everybody away and have only the people remaining are people that, are, that the job is actually calling out to. So I use this in the job interview to speak to the candidates. <laughs> Then what happens is I move them, so I'm, I'm blending two, two, two stories together. After we create the custom job benchmark, we take the subject matter experts to an online assessment, and they create what's called a custom job benchmark. So each person takes a job assessment as the job, and we put it in what's called a multi-respondent report. This multi-respondent report then tells us what the job says about the three areas, we call them sciences, that we're looking for. So we measure for 20, uh, 25 uh, job competencies. We measure for 12 driving forces, and we measure for 12 behaviors. So just so you know, the driving forces, that's the culture piece. This is the least changeable in, in, in an individual. So when we cast the job, we actually create the rebar inside the custom job benchmark are the driving forces of the job. I'm going to show you what a candidate assessment looks like next. So when we create those driving, when we create this custom job benchmark, it tells us about these three sciences, and then what it'll do, it'll read to us, this is the job. This is the job saying, hey, listen, this is what I need to be fulfilled. And what we can do is we can look down and we can see, okay, their competencies. So we're looking for somebody who's customer focused, futuristic thinking, flexible, again, completely organic, right? And so it ranks everything and it tells us that we want somebody who's well developed or does it not matter. These are areas that can be trained. We measure it against 68% of the population. So this is the actual job itself. After we're finished interviewing them, we take them to a group interview 
And then if they're still interested and we're interested in them, we'll bring them to a simulation, a second interview simulation. We'll actually give them some problems to solve, some conversations to have with some other people. If it goes well there, we take them to the online survey. And the online survey will produce what's called a candidate assessment. So if you're following me here, we have the job. And then independent of the job, we have the candidate now going to take an assessment. Well, of course, we're going to assess for the same thing in the individual. So you've got the individual. We're going to look at their behaviors. We're going to look at their culture. And we're going to look at their competencies. And then we're going to look at what happens when we integrate their culture and their behaviors and how they are going to respond once they're on the job. So we'll actually get a little bit of a simulation by looking at this. And we run what's called a gap report. And the gap report measures the distance between the individual and the job. Coolest thing ever. So over here, you're going to see, we're looking for somebody. Now, these don't exactly go together. Um, I don't believe that these are three samples, but I don't think so. If you saw futuristic thinking was number two over here, it's number one over here. Don't worry about that. The job is calling for somebody who's going to be at about an 89 in terms of futuristic thinking. 68% of the population is between a 35 and a 60, right? 49 is the mean of 68% of the population, and this person's a 28. And then you look down through and you're like, created innovation, they fall short there. Well, they shall fall short there. Well, they're within one standard deviation there, maybe one standard deviation there. You look down through and you're, and you're like, boy, this is a lot of detail, Jeff. I mean, you're gonna do this for every candidate? Okay. Glad you asked. We'll just come right to the back of the assessment. And we can tell by just taking a look, based on the culture of the position and the culture of the individual, yellow means fair, green means good, and blue means exact. So from a culture perspective, we have a pretty good fit. From a behavior perspective, we have an exact match. So the funny thing about this is, this person would have nailed the interview, absolutely crushed the interview. Their, their resume probably looked exactly what well. they probably, everybody loved this person because of how they behaved. Because of the language of observable behavior, their disc profile, we liked what we saw. But here's what we need to know is that after some period of time, and this person moves from what's called their adapted state into their natural state, they're going to become a little bit discontent with the culture of the position. Then you take into the idea of one more thing that's, that's really kind of interesting is these are their competencies. These are the things you're going to have to train into them. So if you're not very good at training futuristic thinking and creative and innovation and self-starting and negotiation. This person is going to begin to not perform very well with the aspects of the job, even though they're going to give off the impression from their behavior style that they're, they're, they, they, they will. They just don't have the job competencies. So you might hire somebody, Lisa, that you're like, I need somebody who goes out there and finds their own business. And they, they have the gift to gab. And, you, you know, oh, somebody will tell you, oh, you ought to talk to so-and-so. Philip, oh, he's got the gift to gab. He's got a lot of contacts. Well, in his behavior style, he's perfect, right? In his culture, he maybe has never worked in your type of environment before. He's not really good with the low music and the dim lights and the, you know, he just I, it's the whole thing just maybe freaks him out a little bit. I don't know what, what it is, right? But then you take in the idea that he's actually never made a cold call before. He's actually never went to a networking event before. He's actually never had to make a sales plan before. Now he's behind the eight ball here. So you take somebody who looks the part, but they're going to fail in the position. Now, let me, let me say this in closing. Here's what I love best about all this. EEOC says that we are not allowed to hire and fire based on assessments. So you need to hear me say that. I actually hire people like that. And here's how, here's how I get away with it. See this report right here? This one on the end, the, uh, the, the, the talent report? The talent report actually comes with an instruction manual of the individual. It tells me how to coach the individual. And for me, I got my tolerances. 
And I've developed training plans. I've developed systems and processes. So I don't mind. I use this as a tool to actually expand my view of hiring rather than limit my view of hiring. This is not to limit your view of hiring. If that was the case, I would just be an assessment company. I'd be selling assessment licenses all day long telling you, just sign up and at 240 bucks a pop, just keep, just keep assessing people, right, until you find the right one. I, I actually believe quite the contrary. My thing is, if you find somebody and you know what you're getting, it's like buying a used car. It's like buying a used car is not inherently bad as long as you know what's wrong with it and you're willing to put the time and attention into it. So... That's my that's my thought on job benchmarking. So I've got the key accountability state, uh, statements. I've got the talent report. I've got the benchmark. By the way, inside the benchmark, I've got interview questions that are custom to the job. So if I'm going to pass this along to another manager, it's already templated for me. So I could actually hand this off to somebody else and teach them the process by, by showing them where the behavior-based interview questions are inside the assessment to make sure that this person that I'm going to spend the 240 bucks on has the capability of even passing the assessment. So that's the that's the idea behind hiring right the first time. I believe we're in a we're in a culture today where um, we we need to up our game. I think it's time. I think we need to up our game. I think we need to get a little bit wiser. I think we need to catch up with our candidates a little bit. I believe there's people out there that have um, you know got their seat changed in school, got grades changed, you know, got to do Florida virtual school because I didn't like sitting in a classroom, you know, I, all these things that we laugh about the culture for, you know, they all got trophies, you know, they played baseball until they were 16 years old, never kept score, you know, all these things that we look and go, oh gosh, you know, we're going to hire all these people who need to be coddled. That's not the case. It's not the case. Actually, it, we, what I'm finding is that these people they think like entrepreneurs. I mean, these people are readily engaged in the culture. They're more educated than any other generation. We just need to be wiser as leaders as what we're going to do with them as we bring them into our organization. Stephanie, I'll let you start us off on what your what your lessons learned are from today. I'm about to off. learn more about how to add this to our hiring process, the assessments. Keep in mind, there's a case study, and I can send this to you if you're interested. It says that if you use an assessment, you you're better than 50% of hiring right the first time. If you use just an assessment. My problem with using assessment is you're hiring against your own personal bias. If you use an assessment combined with a benchmark, you're somewhat up around 90% of accuracy of hiring right the first time when you use the, from a case study that we have through TPI. So you up your chance of finding the right person tremendously when you use custom job benchmark as opposed to just using an assessment. Any other closing thoughts? Jen, how about if we just go around the table? Um, just to be more open-minded. People think different, people are different, and instead of maybe closing down from those people, find a way to adapt and be more open towards those people. Yeah. It's more of a getting to know someone individually. Yeah. And you know, this whole idea of trust, right? I mean, but here's the other thing, I can go on for days, but we're at a time where personal awareness is at an all-time low. Personal awareness. So. Personal awareness back in the day was how we got jobs. How we, we're now dealing with people who have very low levels of personal. They don't understand their influence on people. And primarily because of this. It's head down. Head down action. It's, it's things that we can do across the internet or through LinkedIn or, or we can make ourselves look better over social media, but we don't act, we don't, many of us don't have the practice of actually doing that. Um. I've learned a lot today, but I think seeing that right there really helped me to identify a gap in my hiring process. I'm very behavioral. You know, I ask questions the way they answer them. Like, that was a really good answer. I feel this person great fit for the team. You know, they got the experience on paper, but I don't sit there and think, okay, outside of this in the natural state, are they going to be there? Is there going to be longevity? Are they going to, they say, oh yeah, I'm very adaptable, flexible to change. You throw me in a new process. I love learning new stuff. But then it's like, okay, if you actually throw that stuff, how are they going to be receptive to it? And that right there is credit and uh, identifier of that. Lisa, any thoughts? Um, I, I really enjoyed your assessment, and I agree with what he had just said, too. Or you <clears throat> you can see like that they would be a really good fit in the category of personality or whatnot, and you can make yourself look great on paper. 
but um, what I'm running into is that they can't actually perform. So I think we just need to, like, for me personally, I just need to um, maybe think a little bit more outside of the box. And like you had said earlier, try not to find somebody like me. Right. You know? And, and and try to like get rid of the labels, if you will, because I don't really fit into any of those boxes. Like right. technically, I'm labeled as a millennial, but I don't perform like a millennial. Right. So I just need to think of people in a, in a, in a more, I don't know, like greater scheme of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's really good. Yeah. And I will also say that, like Lisa said, sometimes we have to look outside of our industry. Um, I've been. I am a major proponent of that. Is I, I personally, I don't like retreading inside of an industry. I think that some of the greatest goodness can come by looking at people from like industries. Um, and I mean like industries, meaning, for example, somebody who sells insurance. That's they, they, and I'm speaking of somebody who sells. Sorry, I'm always defacting de to a salesperson. But um, somebody who sells insurance is selling something that people need but don't want. Okay, so that person who's a superstar insurance person tries to go sell Ferraris. They're, they're selling things that people want but don't need. So we have to recognize that there's a pattern. I have a grid that I'll show. So if, you, if you're in the title business and you're looking for people, there may be people in like industries that could perhaps fit within your culture uh, or get you, you know, at least in the zone of finding the candidates. Um, I appreciate you all being.